Good morning, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to day two of the Singapore Bicentennial Conference that is organized by the Institute of Policy Studies, which is part of the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy at the National University of Singapore, or NUS for short. This conference benefits from the support of the Singapore Bicentennial Office, as well as several of Singapore's corporate and educational organizations. There is a special feature of today's program which we want to highlight. At the start of sessions two, three, and four, we will screen short three-minute video clips of young Singaporeans sharing their reflections on Singapore's bicentennial and what they think our history means to them. These videos were recorded at the end of the bicentennial experience that is showing at Fort Canning Park. In addition to the more than 100 students here, these videos allow us to infuse our conversation at our conference with the voices of young Singaporeans. We hope you will give your attention to them. The first clip, which we will screen shortly, focuses on the core national value of openness. After that, we will present session two of the conference, which is titled Separations and Connections. The session will focus on the political, social, and cultural developments in Southeast Asia that took place during the different waves of colonization and Singapore's unique role during those. The speakers at this session are Professor Wang Guangwu, who is university professor at the National University of Singapore, and Professor Leonard Andaya, who is professor of Southeast Asian history at the Department of History in University of Hawaii. To moderate the session, we are pleased to have Mr. Kwa Chong Guan, Senior Fellow of S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies at Nanyang Technological University. He is deeply knowledgeable about Singapore's history. May I now invite you to turn your eyes to the screen to hear the voices of young Singaporeans on the topic of openness, after which the time will go to Mr. Kwa to introduce the session and the speakers to present their views. From the show that I just watched, um, they showed a lot of uh, people from all around the world, not only from a certain country or our neighboring countries, which is like Malaya or even the Indonesia. It comes from somewhere further like Arabia or even China. And I feel that that is why Singapore is a very acceptive country, that they accept people from all around the world. Thus, I feel that till today, that Singapore is still acceptive and that's what I really like about Singapore. I felt that globalization and connectedness was a major theme throughout the show. For example, uh, when we were first starting out as a trading hub, we had lots of connections to nearby uh, civilizations. But then uh, when our connection got cut off, our development also slowed down. Globalization really is our key driver of success. I think that we need to remember that Singapore was a port trading port and something that we all need to remember is that we were all once immigrants. For example the Samsi women right they were foreigners once and like they also came to Singapore and like they were new to the environment but um, ultimately they still settled down and they and that they, they have made a great impact on Singapore. As our country develops we will get definitely a lot more expats and modern immigrants and I think sometimes we shun them even though they do the jobs that we shun. And in my opinion, I think that we should be more opening and welcoming towards them. In some cases, their families are not in Singapore. They're working overseas to support their families. And coming into a new environment is definitely not easy. So I feel as a whole, I think we should try to be more understanding and considerate. Yeah, I think that people are main strength, especially focusing on our aging population. Many of our last few years might be spent in poor health. For example, we're seeing uh, diabetes or other health conditions becoming a bigger and bigger problem. So my vision for Singapore would be somewhere where even older uh, people are taken care of. The next step would really be connecting to these elderly ourselves to make the last few years more productive. We need to find ways to tap into these uh, more older people's uh, 
a wealth of experience, you know, because they've been in the workforce and they can tap on these experiences to guide uh, younger workers on how to navigate the rather complex landscape of work now that we have technological disruptors and various economic disruptors as well. And I feel that it is important for us to be able to allow the special needs to reach their full potential as most of them are not academically inclined but they do have other talents that normal people might not have. I think uh, normal schools should actually have um, events with special needs schools to be able to know more about special needs and to not be scared of them and we should also edu and parents should make it a point to educate their children. Very good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to session two of our conference here. Yesterday, we looked at the very big picture of where is Singapore in that big scale, time and space of the region's history. <coughs> in this session here, we have two distinguished panelists, Professor Wang Gangu and Professor Leonard Da, who will drill down to look more specifically at our connections and separations or disconnections with that uh, region, immediate region around us. Our history into nationhood starts with an anti-colonial struggle for independence. It's a story about an anti-colonial struggle for independence and our development as a city-state against the odds. It's a story of defining ourselves as a nation, who we are as a nation. It's a story about ourselves gazing at our own navel. But I think post-1997 financial contingent and into the 21st century, we realized that our fortunes and fate are very closely interconnected with others in the region and further afield in an increasingly globalized, interdependent world. We are deeply connected and networked to others that we have become disconnected with in two ways. First, across space, we were connected to others, our immediate neighbours, Malaysia, Indonesia, and further, our regional neighbours, in particular, China and India. These were connections we have lost or became disconnected from as we focus on gazing at our navel to define who we were as a city-state, nation-state. The Cold War also then further divided us from others in the region. But second, uh, across time, we were connected to others. The bicentennial of the arrival in Singapore, and I quote here how he signed himself off, an obedient and humble and faithful, humble servant of the Honourable Company. As he, as Raffles signed himself off on all his correspondence, is an appropriate time, I think, to, as all our previous speakers and Mr. Janadas reminded us in the opening remarks, is an appropriate occasion to review our deep connections across time with others in the region. So, to help us reconstruct how we were separated and connected across space and time, our professors Wang Gangu and Leonard Andaya. Uh, their briefs for what our conference conveners I have asked them to address are outlined in your conference brochures. It's a wide-ranging brief, and I believe if Professor Andaya and one were to try to respond in detail to all the questions in that brief, uh, we'll be here for the rest of the morning. For example, just on the question of uh, 
What were the effects of early Dutch and Portuguese influence on the regional states? How did they adapt to colonial incursions? Well, that was the subject of a two-day conference at the National Museum on Encounters and Connected Histories, prelude to 1819, which Professor Andaya was a keynote speaker at. So we are delighted that he's here to further share more thoughts with us on this topic of connected histories. The CVs of Prof Wang and Prof Andaya are in your conference material. Uh, I will not take up more time trying to summarize their CVs. You can read it faster than I can, uh, read it out to you. And so without much further ado, I think we'll invite Professor Andaya first to tell us about a past, a connected past that most of us here are unaware of or have forgotten. Professor Sandaya. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Janadas and his very efficient team for the invitation to speak to you today. Uh, this is a great honor. This is um, the fourth of a bicentennial event that I've been part of. Um, I began with the ACM's event in March, and uh, this week I spoke at the National Museum, and the National Library, and now here. And I'm very fortunate that uh, Mr. Janadas has a arrange for us to see the bicentennial experience in Fort Canning Hill. So I'll have seen five of your events um, uh, this, this week itself. So what I wanted to mention as well is that there seems to be some special bond with Singapore. The first time I really became involved with Singapore was in 1965, I know. It's a long time ago, and so you become part of the history, as it were. So I was here with uh, something that people don't do very much anymore, with the Yale Glee Club. And we were on a world tour, and one of the stops was in Singapore. And so we were singing, I'm not sure where, it might have been the Raffles uh, Museum, the old Raffles Museum, but I'm not sure. But after we finished one of the pieces, this was in 1965, there was a noticeable commotion in the, in the audience, and then someone from the audience walked up to the stage and announced that Singapore was no longer part of Malaysia. So I, I feel that I've been uh, at a very important junction, a uh, juncture in Singapore's history, uh, the beginning of a time when Singapore had to go it alone. And it was only subsequently that I realized that the leaders uh, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew and his team were also very worried about the ability of Singapore to be able to survive um, apart from another larger entity. Because if you look at the history of Singapore, you can see that Singapore has always been linked um, earlier uh, to the, the Malay kingdoms that were dominant in the Straits of Malacca, then subsequently with the British Empire, and then part of the nation state. But once they were uh, freed from that kind of relationship, they had to try to find a new way. And it is uh, the success, I think, of uh, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew and his people that made Singapore such a well-known name in the world. Because what it has done is to find a new linkage, this time to the entire globe. And so this, this name of Singapore, the global city, or the global city-state is one that really deserves praise, mainly because the Singaporeans did it uh, on their own. And this is something that I uh, would like very much to um, congratulate you on. And all of these celebrations that I've been, or commemorations that I've been part of, indicate the success of Singapore. And you can see the difference in 19, uh, 69, when I was doing my doctoral research here in Johor and in Singapore, it was very difficult to buy history books that were on the history of Singapore before 1965. 
Um, and so you had a sense that they had cut off the past and they were really trying to determine what they're gonna do in the future. But today, it's very interesting that the Singaporeans are confident enough now that they can hold a bicentennial based on raffles, basically, or the British, which shows a confidence which I don't think would have been there in 1965. And even though there have been criticisms about the, 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 the colonial era period that's been commemorated, I still think that it shows uh, the willingness to take on post-colonial post critiques and so forth because of the success that Singapore has had. So one of the things that I would like to do today is to examine something which these commemorations, I don't know about the one in Fort Canning Hill, but what these commemorations have not really done too much about. There are certain things in the National Museum's exhibition and also in the National Library, but they have basically ignored a very important part of the past. And so what I'd like to uh, address today is another, the very early connections of Singapore with the world. And it's not something that is highlighted mainly because it was not as significant as it was later in the 19th and the 20th and 21st centuries. But it is an important part of the history and needs to be uh, looked at more carefully. So what I've tried to do is to look at Singapore in the pre-19th context, the global context as well as the regional context. And what I've suggested is that Singapore was part of an area, which I call the sea, of the Straits of Malacca as a central part of it, but also the islands to the north and to the south of the Straits of Malacca. And in another talk, I've described what I call the Nagara Salat, which is the realm of the Straits, because this was actually what is mentioned. If you look at both the European sources and the Malay sources, you can see they are referring to this whole area as one. It's all often called the Salat by itself, or the sea, the Laut. Um, and so you, you do have a sense that foreigners as well as the local people view the region as one, uh, Nagara Salat. And what is important here is that Singapore was part of this larger sea, the Nagara Salat. So it was um, important in the sense that it was um, in a very larger context, uh, which, uh, Professor Franco Pan talked about yesterday about this very large international trade of which Singapore was a part. Um, but also it was a very important part of the Nagara Salat itself. And one of the things I'm talking about today and which I'd like us to think about as you commemorate the 200 year anniversary here is the role that the Orang Laut, the sea people played in the history of Singapore. And so I don't take exception to some of the comments that have been made about uh, the, the various settlements that were in Singapore very early and uh, the, the presence on maps and so forth and so on. Because what I argue is that Singapore before the 19th century was an outpost. And even with the uh, name of Shabandaria, which the Portuguese use, it still, still serves as an, it still served as an outpost rather than a major entrepot on the scale as Srivijaya or Malacca um, in, in the past. So this is my contention. And I've just brought this slide to indicate again the very important place of Singapore and the Salat Malacca in that Northwest international trade. So uh, Professor Franco Pan has already talked about the movement of these goods from the Middle East, um, also from uh, East Africa to India, uh, through the Straits of Malacca, and then on to China, Japan, Korea, Ryukyu Islands. And this international trade was a very ancient one. And you can see already from the very beginning of the common era how uh, places 
were, were mentioned. So this is uh, the important context for understanding the role of Singapore and the Salat Malacca. And so if you look at this map of Southeast Asia, you can see that uh, there are, that the Southeast Asia is located smack in the middle of these two major trading areas to the east and to the west. And Professor Borschberg talked about yesterday about three areas through which the ships could sail in, in, in the early days, but the most important by far was the Straits of Malacca. And where the ships went, therefore, was through the lands which I've called the Nagara Salat. And so let me look at the Nagara Salat then. At the, at the core of the Nagara Salat, of course, was the Straits of Malacca. So in, early, in the earlier centuries of the common era, there was not much movement through the Straits, and in fact, it was a movement across to the uh, Isthmus of Kra in that area, then through the Trans Peninsula route to the Bay of uh, Siam, the, uh, Bay, the Gulf of Thailand, and from there they, the goods were transshipped on other ships for the onward journey through Champa in central Vietnam, then on to southern China. So this was the earlier uh, movement of goods. This was the route that was taken in earlier centuries. Then about the fourth or the fifth centuries, there was starting to become then a movement through the Straits of Malacca. And I was very interested in the comments that Professor Borschberg made about how at one stage in the beginning of the Little Ice Age that the winds started to gradually disappear from the northern part of the Malays uh, of the Malacca Straits, which then determined that the movements of ships could move down all the way through the Straits. And the reason why this is important is because, counterintuitively, there is a major north northeast monsoon winds blowing from the northeast down into the Straits of Malacca. But interestingly enough, it is the northeast monsoon winds which turn and become the northwest, northwest winds at the northern end of the Straits of Malacca, which blow the ships to the Straits of Malacca. So it's the northeast winds, not the southeast monsoons, which make that important. And so the, this, this, this theory that it was the lack of, of, the, of the winds in the northern part of Malacca does ring true. The other thing that is very important about the Straits of Malacca is that you have the mountains of Sumatra, the spine of Sumatra, and the spine of the Malay Peninsula serving as barriers to the very strong winds, first blowing from the northeast and then later from the southeast. And this is what made the Straits of Malacca particularly important uh, for the east-west trade. So in addition to being in the middle of the trading route and therefore uh, some a place where people could rest, uh, recuperate, repair, and so forth, uh, it was also protected um, from the very strong winds. And so one of the things that I'm also looking at much more closely in studying the region is how the environment really affects the, uh, the, the story of what is going on here. So here we you can look at the northeast monsoons blowing from the northeast from January to April and then uh, the reverse movement in the southwest monsoons. But what usually isn't shown in many of these books is the circular motion the, as the winds blow in a clockwise direction. What it does then, if you blow from the northeast and move in a clockwise direction, you are covering a lot of eastern Indonesia and the rest of the archipelago. Uh, and bringing goods from the east to the Straits of Malacca and then uh, to international traders who are based in the Straits of Malacca. So the winds are extremely important. Um, and the winds, of course, determine the currents. But one of the things one learns very quickly as you start looking at small areas of the region is that you do have very local currents as wind and winds. And so what I always tell my students is to study the, the piece of sea that you have determined to be your area of, of research. 
and look at the sea in various levels, not only the surface of the sea where the winds blow, but also under the sea, the subsurface, when the currents are affected by the winds and basically the, the types of goods or types of um, elements that you find below the surface, such as uh, coral reefs and uh, sandbanks and so forth and so on, and looking at the intertidal area. So all of this uh, becomes part of the, the area's environment and helps to explain the importance of the Nagara Salat. So the southern part of the Nagara Salat is perhaps the, one of the most important as well, along with the Straits of Malacca, because it's that area of large number of archipelagos. We talk about the Rialinga archipelago, but you also have the archipelagos in the South China Sea and those uh, along Southwest Borneo. These are all part of the Nagara Salat. This, these are areas where the principal inhabitants in the past were the Orang Laut, or the Sea People. And the reason is um, very understandable, uh, because it is in this area that they were able to take advantage of the environment. First, first let me just say very quickly about the emergence of the Orang Laut. The French uh, have, the French have uh, looked at the the Orang Laut and the, the Malay groups in very early times, archaeologists have. And one of the interesting theories that they've advanced, and I, I find it very attractive, is that the Sea Peoples were once part of the same group as the Malays. And you can see it in the languages themselves, in the theories of the migration of the Austronesian peoples, and so forth. And so what they argue is that sometime in the early centuries of the Common Era, the Orang Laut broke away from the Malay group. And one of the theories is that it's because there were, that the Orang Laut group decided that there were some very important economic opportunities arising, and they decided to focus on the sea rather than on the rivers, which is really one of the basic elements of, the Malay, of Malay culture, that the rivers are oftentimes more important than actually the sea. And so the focus on the sea and if, if, they're, tr they're, if they're correct that it occurred in the early centuries of the Common Era, then it links very much with the rise of certain Malay entrepot states um, in the region at about the same time. And so when they decided to focus on the sea, they did it with goring knowledge of the kinds of environment in which they operated. So the Straits of Malacca, for example, has you're haline waters, which means that there are different salinities, much less saline than the kinds of waters, say, in the ocean, uh, open ocean, such as Pacific Ocean or the Indian Ocean, which means that there are variations of salinity in the, in the Straits of Malacca because they are also being fed uh, by the rivers that are on both sides of the Straits. And so they were able to take advantage of this uh, for their subsistence, the kind of fish, the kind of animals that were found in those kinds of waters. But it also was an area where you had large amount of mangrove swamps um, and the deltas. And so these were environments in which the Orang Laut really prospered in. And so they developed that uh, knowledge um, and they also began to develop knowledge of the seas as they went in search of, the, of Tripang or of the sea turtle. Um, and so they learned a lot about where the reefs were, uh, the dangers of sandbanks, and how currents and winds operated in the Nagara Salat. So they were very well placed to become very important sources, uh, important allies to the, the Malays who continued to be much more of a riverine people. So if you look at the Sea Peoples online, you can see that there are boats like the houseboats of the Sea Peoples. Um, these are another Sea Peoples. They're not Orang Laut. I have ones on Orang Laut, but this one was of the Samabajau, which are another group. But they are similar in uh, many regards in houseboats where their families live. But you also have the talk of the Orang Laut being very important as a coastal patrol as uh, protectors of the sea lanes for these Malay kingdoms. 
And they wouldn't have been able to do that with these small little houseboats. Instead, you have a very nice um, uh, depiction of the larger Orang Laut boats, which the Spanish archives call the uh, Malay pirate ships. Uh, many of these would have been used by the Orang Laut in the guarding, guarding of the sea straits. And then you get the more, the extreme end of this, which was the, the, um, the sea peoples in the southern Philippines, the Ilanun. And they're very large warships, which could um, hold o over 200 people so that they were able to even attack uh, European ships. So that you had varieties of different Orang Laut boats. And it's the technology of the Orang Laut community which is only now being studied. Um, I was very pleased to meet someone who is looking at the Orang Laut boats to try to determine uh, what kind of boats they were. But we know that they were adapted to the conditions, that they were shallow uh, drafts so that they could go upriver um, easily or go through the mangrove swamps, but you had larger draft boats which could take them all the way to the north coast of Australia. So there was a complementary relationship between the Malays and the Orang Laut. And here I talk about complementary because much of the literature on the Orang Laut tend, uh, tends to depict them as being subservient to the Malay kingdoms, and this was never the case. There was an alliance of interest, the Orang Laut had superior navigational skills and knowledge of the waters of the Nagara Salat, whereas the Malays uh, had the organization for international trade and could attract a large number of traders. So what you have in the historical evidence, and I was pleased, I, I found this, uh, there is this evidence for the Orang Laut, but one of my students who did his PhD on the Samabajau in the eastern part of Indonesia have actually demonstrated in the sources themselves, including Bajau sources, uh, Bajau written sources, which is again something that we don't have for the Orang Laut in the Western Archipelago, that the Orang Laut were, uh, the, that the Sama Bajau, like the Orang Laut in Malacca, were instrumental in the selection and the building and the success of the Malay entrepots in Malacca and in the Sama Bajau areas in the areas of um, Southeast Sulawesi. So this successful relationship can be found, the evidence for it can be found in all of these areas that I call the Anthropos states in the Straits of Malacca, Gantoli from the 5th, 7th century. So that would have been the first, perhaps, where Orang Laut began to become important, and then Trivijaya from the 7th to the 14th, Malacca from 1400 to 1511, and Johor from 1530s to the late 19th century. So they were operating a similar role through all of these centuries because their skills were still appreciated and needed uh, by the Malay kingdoms. So what was the role of Singapore? Bring Singapore back into the picture. What was the role of Singapore in the Nagara Salat? And what you find is there are references to Singapore for example, in 1330, there are Vietnamese annals that record the coming, coming of Malay-speaking envoys from Tomasek. So this is the earliest that I know of. Uh, maybe Peter Boschberg might have others. Huang Da Yuan, for example, which most people quote, this is from 1349, and they talk about two settlements, uh, one of Chinese and local indigenous people, which were Orang Laut, and then another settlement up on Fort Canning Hill, who may have been Malays. And then you get the mention of in the Majapahit court chronicle of the Deshawarnana in 1365. But the first uh, mention of Singapore, I think, was in the Arab geographer Ibn Majid in 1462. What is significant here is that all of these early references to Singapore was in the 14th century. And if you look at the history of the Nagara Salat in the 14th century, late 14th century, uh, what you realize that this is the period of the decline of Srivijaya and a period of transition from Srivijaya into Malacca. And so Singapore remained, it was an Orang Laut base under the Malay kingdoms and it continued to be an Orang Laut base because the Kutru, the uh, gem dealer from Belgium, which Professor uh, Boschberg talked about, um, he commented that there were many Saletes, the Orang Laut, uh, 
who knew all the many channels through the region. And this is one of their strengths. And then you got the 17th century Dutch material, one of the earliest Dutch material, VOC material of Matles in 1610, where he talks about the leader of the Orang Lang being someone called the Sri Rajanagara. And then in another VOC document of 1719, there's a mention of a Rajanagara again as a leader of the Orang Laut in Singapore. And the reason for the importance of Singapore is because of uh, the three straits that are very close to the Singapore Straits. These are the Straits of Pedranka, uh, Middle Rock, and South Ledge. And what is important also is the place, as Professor Boschberg mentioned, at the mouth of the Johor River. With the capitals up the Johor River, this was a way in which the Orang Laut guarded the ships, uh, guarded the rivers, as was the case in earlier times. And so in conclusion then, what I suggest is that Tomasak in Singapore was part of this larger world, but it was always an outpost. It was an outpost of the Orang Laut, an important outpost, because it was here that the Orang Laut uh, was based, or major parts of the Orang Laut was based, uh, were, were based. But then you, there were other areas in the uh, Nagara Salat where you had Orang Laut groups. So we talk about Bintan as another area. Uh, we, we, we talk about the Karimun. There could have been a number of areas where the Orang Laut would have been based. But Singapore was ideal because of these three straits which led between the Straits of Malacca and, and uh, the uh, South China Sea. So this was a period up until the beginning of the 19th century. So I, be I, I, I believe that there is a major turning point that comes in the early 19th century. Once the British take over Singapore, they convert it into part of the, uh, the British Empire. And so you find that uh, many of the uh, tasks and the importance of the Orang Laut uh, are lost as a result of the new direction of Singapore. And so what you do have now is an export economy based on extractive industries, um, and the uh, Nagara Salat uh, do not play such an important role for the Orang Laut as it did in the past. And Professor Wang will be looking at the, the new Singapore from 1890 onward. Thank you. Well, thank you, Prof. Andaya, for introducing us to the lost world of the Orang Laut. Uh, <clears throat> whom the British Raffles Crawford, well not Raffles Crawford, Munshi Abdullah described as a dirty, marginalized, nomadic group living on those little floating boats in the Singapore River. As Professor now trying to tell you, they were actually, they actually had a very proud different past in which in an earlier era, they were the warriors of the Malacca and Johor Sultans. And if you read the Dutch chronicles as he has, you would see that the Dutch were constantly worrying. How many warriors can the Sultan of Johor bring to help us lay siege to Malacca? And it goes on there. But the other role of the Orang Lao, which Professor I may not have uh, emphasized enough, is that they were essentially essential as pilots for those of us who sail, paddle around the southern islands, it is confusing, and especially so for those early Portuguese and Dutch seafarers. So if you read the account of the Dutch Admiral Eckenhausen in 1602, I think, he was trying to get to the mouth of the Johor River, Changi, from Jurong, and he was lost for five days. He was sailing aimlessly around the southern islands and finally had to kidnap an Orang Lao Patin and say, bring me out of this mess here. And so that was the role of the Orang Lao there. And uh, so on that note here, let me stop. We can go on about the Orang Lao stories, which we can if you want to after in the question time. But now, invite uh, Prof. Wang Gangu to tell us about the connections, or the later connections of Singapore with its world. <laughs> 
Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. I'll take it from uh, where Leonard and I took, left it, Singapore in uh, 1819. But just to go back a little bit more, is that uh, what Singapore really celebrated, in my lifetime anyway, was its separation in 1965. I use the word celebrate a little carefully here because to some people it was a tragedy, but to many others it was a celebration to see us independent Singapore arising from totally unexpected circumstances. But this word separation was a big word for quite a while, for the last 50 years, and uh, many, many historians refer to it. But what struck me was that the word actually applied also to 1819. And Professor Ndaya has, in a way, mentioned the kind of separation that changed the role of many of the indigenous peoples around the area. But what was uh, particularly important, of course, was that it was a connection, too. It was a connection that enabled the East India Company in Calcutta, with its ultimate development really in India, and ultimately the British Empire in India, connecting it to the area that they traded most with at the time, which was China. And it's something for us to remember that China was a great empire at that time. Nobody expected this empire to collapse so rapidly in the 19th century. But at the beginning of the 19th century, it was still regarded with awe by many of the countries around the world. Many other empires looked to the Chinese empire as one of the great powerful ones around uh, at the time. So it was a connection between the beginnings of a British empire in India, and a well-established ancient empire in China, in a way reminding us of the present, that the established empire was China, the rising empire was the British one in India, and Singapore was the connection, because that trade between India and China became far more important than ever. Before that, you realize all, all the tea trade that was coming uh, from China to, the, to Europe essentially came from the Cape of South, the Cape of Good Hope, right across the uh, Indian Ocean uh, towards China, using, using the, the Lombok Strait or the, uh, <clears throat> the Straits, Sunda Straits, into the South China Sea. Uh, there was, Strait of Malacca wasn't that important. But once the British started to establish themselves in India with Madras and Calcutta, then the story becomes different. They needed, then you can see the foundation of Penang, and then the Straits of Malacca becoming important. And of course, the Napoleonic War gave the British a taste of what it meant to be able to control, at least for a while, Java and, of course, the Straits of Malacca and the Straits of Singapore. And it was in that period that people like Raffles and Rafaqua understood the, the fact that they, too, needed this route to China, where the, where the trade was becoming even more important as the trade develop into one between opium and tea. Opium from India and tea in, in China. And this trade was really so important to the rising empire as well as to the established empire that uh, important safe routes should be found. And to, to connect those two through the Straits of Malacca, Singapore was a good choice. I won't go into that. But simply to say that this word separation led me to think, what happened when 20 years later, the uh, British established the colony of Hong Kong, and then the opening of the treaty ports in China? The, the M M imperial relationship changed enormously after that. Defeating China in the Opium War meant that the, the rising empire was now actually equal to, if not more powerful, than the established empire. And so we have in Hong Kong, and then of course the treaty port in particular, the rise of Shanghai, a completely different balance in the relationship. And as a result, we, we talk about Hong Kong as not a separation, but a connection, emphasizing its connection, not only the connection between the British in Calcutta and China, but the connection with China itself. In fact, it was in the context of talking about one country, two systems, that I came to that conclusion that from the very beginning, in 1840s, it was one country, two systems. Because although it was a colony, 
But Hong Kong was supposed to be independent and separate from China. It was never really separated. The people of Hong Kong were all from China, almost all from China. Everything to do with Hong Kong had to do with the China trade, and in particular, the treaty ports that were open on the coast of China. The whole coastal trade, as it were, one element was Hong Kong. So the connection was very much deep connection with the hinterland of China, still a, a, a great empire up to that point. In contrast, then, if you look back at what Raffles was doing, he did not connect with the hinterland in the Malay states, nor did he want to connect with the, any part of the archipelago controlled by the Dutch. The Dutch had his own empire, and the British and the Dutch, wanting to remain friendly, came to an understanding about how to divide their relationship so that they would not have to fight over anything or quarrel over, over minor things. So they had their treaty, 1824, which drew that line down the Straits of Malacca, which of course still very significant today. So the separation was a very different kind of separation. It was a very fundamental one, which actually divided the Malay world, the Malay states from the Malay states of Sumatra, the Malay states on the hinterland. So that separation was actually much more significant than people realized. So in the case of Hong Kong, it was both connecting. It was connecting British India with the Chinese empire through the ports, but also connecting Hong Kong to the mainland of China, to its hinterland, very deeply. And that connection has been very deep till the present day. And the consequences of that connection are still with us. In the case of Singapore, that very separation, which was peculiar to Singapore, because Singapore was actually also connecting British India with the Chinese empire for that, for that trade in the days of the East India Company, the last days of East India Company and the country traders, all depended very much on having a safe route to China. But that separation was very deep, deeper than people realize. Because if you look at the first decades of Singapore, it was basically all about the China, the China trade. Of course, they had to deal with some of the indigenous peoples who were trading in the area. They had other traders from the Arab world, from Muslim India, Muslim India, the Jews, the Parsis, that followed the British Empire to, on, on their way also to trade with China, but using Singapore as a, as, as a, stop, as a stopover, uh, serving, of course, a local trade as well. But the emphasis was upon the connection between the, the two oceans, in a way, the South China Sea and the Indian Ocean. But the separation was much deeper. And this, I come back to this because there was no separation in the case of Hong Kong. It was connecting, connecting all the way. In the case of Singapore, that separation remained a shadow over Singapore thereafter. And this is how I would like to suggest that we see that separation as not something that started in 1965, but began in 1819, and in fact persisted as a running theme, as it were, in the relationship between Britain and the Malay states ever from that time onwards. When the company folded and the British Empire really began, we look at the empire. The empire, the heart of the empire, was really British India. Whereas the trading connections in the treaty ports of China and Hong Kong was an extension of the empire's outreach, as it were, as it became a global maritime empire. That was a, a connection that was extension of the British Empire centered on India. In that context, Singapore was, remained a very important link. But once Hong Kong and Shanghai really developed, the, the China part of the trade didn't affect Singapore as much as before. In fact, I will go on to say that from, from about 1850s, 60s onwards, particularly after the 1860s onwards, Singapore was really much more ready to connect with its neighbors than before. And they did try to. They started to intervene in the Malay states, as we know, and the, the, the relationship between the Malay states became more, more and more significant right through that time towards building what might be called British Malaya, I think it was actually called that in the 1910s and 20s. British Malaya was a combination of all those Malay states in a very complicated uh, indirect rule method linked up with, in the end, the capital of which was Singapore. The hub was it was Singapore. It was Singapore that provided, as it were, the, the center of all activities pertaining to the new connecting, 
connecting links with the Malay state. But it was never a very comfortable one, largely because it is really only a small part, and I think we have to remember that, a very small part of a global empire. The British were much, much busier in India trying to control those hundreds of millions of people and in extending itself way beyond into the interior of India towards the Northwest and getting involved in the Afghanistan wars and so on. All that was actually involving Britain in so many ways. At the same time, they were competing with the French, with the Germans rising in Africa, elsewhere in the Pacific. And altogether, the British were too busy to really do much to this part of the world. So leaving very much to the Straits settlements to try and rearrange some of the linkages, some of the new connections they now needed because they were not really that important to the major trading centers of British Imperial India and the tremendously competitive situation of the China coast with the British, the French, Germans, Japanese, Americans, all coming into the picture. In that context, connecting or reconnecting with the Malay world was very important to Singapore and attempts were made. But if you look at it, it wasn't very easy. Partly because there was a lack of resources, the British Empire wasn't terribly interested, it was a kind of minor operation in which it was left to the, in, the initiatives of the local officials, mainly the trading centers, the great uh, merchant houses of Singapore and the few officials that were here to try and build together something that would connect with the Malay world in a profitable way that would pay for all the adventures that they were, they were having. So it's in that context, a minor role that Singapore was trying to connect with or reconnect with the Malay world. It was making progress, but as you, some of you will be more familiar than I am, uh, the relationships between uh, Britain and the Malay states through the early 20th century wasn't very comfortable. And this takes me up back to the, the major point about Singapore from the beginning. Because it was always linked with the China trade, and that's my understanding of Singapore's role at, from the beginning, the always great, great deal of importance was placed on how the Chinese fitted into Singapore's larger plan, so to speak. And from the very beginning, you notice from the population figures, the demographies, uh, figures for the 19th century, the rapid rise of, uh, of Chinese numbers in Singapore. It's not accidental. It was from the very beginning something to do with the China trade and anything to do improve Singapore's position vis-a-vis -vis the China trade was encouraged. And this encouraged the Chinese. And in fact, the British recognized it from the beginning, for example, by bringing Chinese from Malacca, the Baba, Pranakan, to Singapore to play a particular role to help them deal with a, 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 a market situation that was fundamentally targeted on China. And then the Chinese who, in the neighborhood, all the local Chinese who have been active in, uh, in the Malay states, in Sumatra, in Java, in West Borneo, they also found it useful to use this free port that the British provided as a, as a rival to the Dutch in providing facilities that the Dutch were reluctant to give them to make use of Singapore for their interests. So there was a second group of the local Chinese in the neighborhood also turning to Singapore, adding to the numbers and providing, as it were, the support for the Baba Pranakan families that came from Malacca that were favored by the British and were, who were able to deal with the British much more successfully than other Chinese. And then, of course, by that time, because of the opening of China, the opening of the treaty ports, the large numbers of Chinese migrating out in an age where slavery had ended, the, the, the need for labor had grown everywhere, and Chinese labor was very welcome, not only by the British, but by the Dutch in particular. And even those Chinese coolies that came down to, to Singapore, they were not really coming to Singapore or to the Malay state, they were actually on their way to Sumatra or el, el, other parts of the Dutch empire to settle. So Singapore became a transit point for also the Chinese coolies, large numbers in the 19th century coming to work in this part of the world. So it is no accident that Singapore became a center for Chinese activities from the very beginning. And it was related to the fact that it was Singapore was separated from the indigenous world around it and based on its China interests 
encourage these linkages with Chinese business interests as well as the labor that the Chinese were able to provide. I, I could go on, but I'll just leave it at that to, just to stress the fact that if you look at the literature for the, Chinese, uh, the British officials in Singapore, right from the beginning, the biggest problem for the British officials was how to manage these Chinese. Very unruly, quarrelsome, different ethnic, sub-ethnic groups, the Hawkins and the Teotihuacans and the other, some Cantonese and others, were competing for resources, all, all sorts of problems. And the British had to learn how to manage the Chinese. And this is a, actually a very important underlying theme in, in Singapore's early history, managing the Chinese. Nobody else. They weren't terribly worried about how, how to handle all the others. The numbers are small. But with the large numbers of Chinese, handling the Chinese was central to the uh, British uh, officials from, I would say, from the 1840s onwards. And to, to the point when it was so, so complicated, they had to create a Chinese protectorate. They had to train special groups to deal with the Chinese, to learn Chinese and handle them. And to the point when, by the turn of the century, when these Chinese became politically conscious of their Chineseness, this problem was magnified even further. It became a political and security issue, more than just a business issue and a, a crime and secret societies issue. And that change might be linked with the discovery of nationalism by the Chinese. When someone like Sun Yat-sen and his group of people they were very active in Singapore. Singapore, in fact, was the most active group, provided the most active supporters of the Chinese National Revolution that finally succeeded in 1911. And that was no accident, again, because there were so many Chinese, but because these Chinese were very much connected then by that time with a new consciousness in China about their national weakness, having been defeated again and again by the West and by, the, by Japan, and that rising nationalist feeling that re-entered, as it were, into the, the actively part of the, uh, the, uh, the experience of, of Singapore became the major issue for the Singapore government by the early 20th century. Uh, I, was, I remember when I first came to Singapore, I was very struck by the simple fact that there were only two major books that surveyed the history of Singapore the first hundred years. One was really by the British, Makepeace, Thackeray, and um, Bradell, I think, which was about 100 years of Singapore. The other one was by Song Ong Siang, on 100 years of the Chinese in Singapore. There was no book about 100 years of the Indians or the Malays. It was 100 years about the Chinese in Singapore, and it was very important. And you read Song Ong Siang's book and go through the list of people involved and so on, you can see why it was such a major issue for the, Chinese, for the, for the British officials too and why it was important that Song Ong Siang's book was given the attention that it was. So already you can see that the Singapore problem was one between the British and the Chinese. That was number one in, in the agenda. And it became even more difficult with national, nationalism, with the Chinese now not just Chinese, not just Hakkas, Cantonese, Hawkins, and Teochews, but a national Chinese, a Chinese conscious of a national identity. Much more, much more difficult. And, and you can read the history of that time when uh, the Chinese had insisted on their rights in the Strait Settlements in particular, that they were fighting for their own place in the sun to have, as it were, an equal status with the British in running the Strait Settlements. Again, I won't go too far into that. Just to remind us that from that time onwards, the question of connecting with the Malay state was complicated by this particular special issue of managing national Chinese in Singapore. And it remained an issue, even more so, when the Japanese came. When the Japanese occupied Singapore, you, you all know what happened there, they very carefully divided the peoples up in a way that the British were trying to avoid. Even though they were conscious of the differences between the Chinese and the Malays, they were terribly, engrossed in trying to make them work together and, and enable, as it were, peace and security for the British to rule this part of the world. But the Japanese made no secret about it. They, they, they could not trust the Chinese, who were their enemies. They wanted to make use of the Malays and build up this Malayo-Indonesian uh, Malay world in which they wanted to have as friends of the Japanese empire. And they encouraged the Indians to build up the Indian National Army to help the Japanese fight in India. So 
Straight away, within months, as it were, of Japanese occupation of this part of the world, the three groups of Malays, Indians, and Chinese were separated out very clearly. So another kind of separation had already taken place. But I, again, I, I just leave it at that because it didn't go very far, but it had some consequences. It made it, of course, even more obvious after the war for all these differences to come up to the fore. And if you look at the situation after that, the, the story is actually very simple. The simple story was all the connecting or the reconnections that the, tri the British tried to establish from the late 19th century down to 1945 and beyond, they were essentially failures. They never really established something very stable. The Malayan Union that they proposed was not acceptable. The Federation of Malaya, while it was agreed to, it was not the British Malaya that the British wanted, it was the Federation of Malaya. And the Malaya the Malays used very clearly from the beginning was not Malaya, it was Tanah Melayu. And the Malays understood that very well. And that's very clear, this is Malay land. And we are agreeing to certain concessions in order to enable us to gain our independence from the British. But the British connecting to form British Malaya had essentially failed. So the separation of 1965 should not have been that much of a surprise, except for the fact that the Singaporean people and the people in Malaya always thought that Singapore and Malaya would become one country. But if you look at the connecting between British Malaya to Greater Malaysia, all the steps along the way were improvisations by the British to try and rescue an idea that they had of bringing the Malays, Malaya together, which finally failed, and the separation was the result of it. I, I mentioned earlier on, all the efforts to connect and reconnect by the British to the indigenous and local conditions essentially failed. But the separation, curiously enough, was successful. In fact, this, you can say the separation of 1819 was successful in creating the kind of world that Singapore Strait Settlements and British Malaya uh, arose from. But the separation after 65 was successful because the people who managed Singapore somehow managed to grasp the idea that connecting with the distant and separating from the near was actually quite a good formula. And if you look at the, if you compare the situation today, one could just simply make one stark contrast. Hong Kong connected all the way, so connected with China that it has implications for the relationship between Hong Kong and China, between the Hong Kong people and China, between China and the idea of Hong Kong itself. All that is part and parcel of a connection that became too close, too locked in to be handled comfortably. So once the British left Hong Kong, that connection became overwhelming. In the past, it was a connection between two worlds, a balance between connecting with China and connecting with Britain. Once the connection with Britain was cut off, that connection was overwhelming. In the case of Singapore, it's just the opposite. Separating from the beginning benefited British control over Singapore and the British-China relationship was built on that understanding. And when separation came again in 1965, the people of Singapore had somehow, maybe unconsciously or subconsciously, understood the benefits of separation and managed to take over, as inherit, take the heritage and build on it to become the global city that we have all talked about, to become the kind of plural society and the efforts to bring about harmonious plural society in this very special kind of nation, not quite a nation state, but a nation which at least is based on a plural society. Very unusual in the world, if I may say so, almost unique. And this was because separation was successful. All the reconnection, connecting and reconnecting were not. So let me end by simply saying that today, Challenges are new challenges. The two new challenges we are all very obvious. One is China's position has changed. It's not an empire, but it's still the most powerful country in the neighborhood, in the region. China's relations with Singapore will be very, very different from what it used to be, when, especially when China was down. Secondly, a nation state in the middle of 10 other nation states of Southeast Asia, that is very new. How this little 
red dot of a nation relates to all the nine others in ASEAN and Southeast Asia in the face of major confrontation build, building up between China and the United States, the two most powerful countries in the world in the context of an Indo-Pacific region, this is the challenge number two. Both of them require tremendous rethinking about what connecting and separating could mean. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Prof Wang, <clears throat> for a very provocative reconstruction of the previous 200 years of our history in terms of our deep connections and yet separation from others in the region. <clears throat> My role as a moderator traditionally has been now to open the floor for discussion and simply take note of those who, have, who raise their hands to speak. But the IPS mastermind brains behind why we are here, Dr. Gillian Cole, sitting very quietly in the second table there, has told me, I'm here to do more than that. I'm here to try to make connections between the presentations. So let me try to do this with what happened, what was said yesterday, where we heard Peter Boschberg talk about the sea as a central theme of the two, the, as of his presentation in which it was about rivalry, Portuguese, Dutch, British rivalry for control of the sea. And let me put it to Prof. Andaya. How did the sultans of the Malacca Strait, from Aceh down to Medan, to Jambi, to Siak, to Malacca, and, you know, and the Malay rulers, how did they respond to this Portuguese attempt, the Estado da India, to impose uh, control of the sea as essential to trade. An idea that the Portuguese and the Spanish were very familiar with from their world in the Mediterranean, where from Roman times, Rome imposed an imperium over the Mediterranean as an uh, essential condition of uh, efficient trade. So, and let me link this up to Prof Wang and the Chinese and the South China Sea to ask Prof Wang, how did the Chinese traditionally look at the sea? Uh, Prof Wang here, at the very beginning of his uh, academic career in 1955, wrote a, what is still a must-consult text on China's early trade with the South China Sea. I think Prof Wang has since uh, talked about whether China is more a continental power or a maritime power that look to the sea. So from that perspective, how did China look at the South China Sea and the uh, British and Dutch and European attempts to impose some order on that sea? Uh, I think here the Ming, activist scholar Wang Ye did attempt to change Chinese mentalities about the sea. So I looked to Prof Wang to follow up on what was Chinese attitudes towards the sea. For us in Singapore, we should be more aware of the sea, but I think many of us have forgotten it. At the most basic level, unless we are a fisherman, or live by the sea, the sea, the tides, the ebb and flow of the tides makes no difference. For me, as a teenager living in my grandfather's home in Pasir Panjang, the sea was central. You know, I watched the sea go up, go down, low tide, I can go out to fish, high tide, I swim. But I think that sense of the rhythm of the sea has been lost today. And which is, I think, something we have to rethink as we look at Singapore as a seaport, a port city that is, Tan Taeyong would say, totally dependent on the sea for our trade. 
before I turn the floor to Prof. Vandaya and to Prof. Wang, I see Mr. Yatiman Yusuf in the audience there. Mr. Yatiman, for, yes, I'm looking at you, Mr. Yatiman, for our younger audience, is a leading literary figure in the Malay community. And now I'd like to ask him if he would like to respond. What is the image within the Malay community of the Orang Lao today here? No. Prof. Anda has given a great sketch. He stopped at the 19th century. So today, who are Orang Lao in Singapore? What is the image? How do you in the Malay community think and look at the Orang Lao, who I think have become, have they become assimilated into the Malay community? So Prof. Yatim, Mr. Yatman, maybe after Prof. Wang, you want to respond to that. So, Prof. Andaya. So, how did the uh, Malay kings or Malay kingdoms respond to the princes of the Portuguese? One of the things that one has to understand about that international trade that I was talking about was that it was looked upon as a great benefit, a boon uh, to the Malays. And so they did everything in order to create the facilities to make trade possible. When the Portuguese arrived and um, attacked Diu, for example, um, in West Coast India, that event was spread among the Malays. So they knew that uh, this was a very different kind of trader that was coming in. So uh, eventually what happened, of course, the old story, we know that the Portuguese took over uh, Malay Malacca and hope then to build upon what the Malays had created, but it didn't work, mainly because uh, of their methods. And so the way that uh, the Malay kingdom responded was to try to reconstruct the center at a different area. And so if you look at the Sulalatu Salatino, the Sajara Malayu, as is better known, you'll see that uh, the, the refugee ruler was taken by the Orang Laut to settle somewhere else in his realm. So it wasn't, it wasn't the physical structure that was important, it was the, the rulers themselves. And during the period that the Portuguese were in there, they really struggled in order to make a go of it. And so what you find is that if you look at the history of the Portuguese in these areas so in 16th and into the 17th century, the group that, the, the Portuguese that really survived was the informal Portuguese, as the Portuguese scholars talk about. These were not the Estado de India. It was not the formal Indian uh, colonial empire. It was the people who were part of that, uh, who were on the edges, the margins of the empire. And what they did was to merge with the Asian uh, trading system that was already there, and this was the reason for their success, where Malacca for the Portuguese was never really as successful as Malay Malacca was because they were constantly um, at the mercy of attacks by different Malay groups, uh, particularly the Achanese at that stage and then later on by Johor. So this is the, the, the story where uh, the, the Malay kingdoms that had been so open to the outside world had to adjust, and they did adjust, but it was the Portuguese who had to adjust more and then later became part of the Asian trading system. Well, you say anything? Well, the Chinese uh, relationship with the sea is a very long story and a complex one. I don't think I can deal with that here. But simply to say that the Chinese did have a uh, at a time when they were very interested in the sea, when they first reached the coast of China uh, from the north. But eventually, they discovered that their major security interests are overland, and that the continental threats to the Chinese empire came almost invariably from the continent. And therefore, they paid much more attention to continental problems. And that, of course, included the, uh, all the people who were attacking the uh, from the Tang Dynasty, Song Dynasty, to the Mongol conquest, down to the Manchus. All those serious threats have always come from overland. And they had concluded, in fact, when Zheng He went down to the Indian Ocean seven times, his, his basic report was, there are no enemies out there. Nobody to be afraid of. You, you don't have to, to, have to be afraid of anybody come by, coming by sea. The conclusion wasn't wrong at the time, except it was one century too early. 
And a century afterwards, everything started to change, and the Chinese never caught up, and they failed to respond to that, and that is why, in the end, they were still continental-minded at a time when the sea had become all-important in global affairs. And this, of course, is something that is about to change. They changed it, of course, they started a change in the 19th century, but they failed because the Japanese defeated them, destroyed their navy, and they never recovered. The whole of the 20th century, the Chinese didn't have any ships to talk of. It was only in the 1990s that they had enough money, a unified country, a unified economy, to start rebuilding a navy. The Chinese navy is frankly no more than about 20 or 30 years old. And for that navy to be considered to be a threat to the world, it seemed to me a really extraordinary, extraordinary claim. But the, the fact that the Chinese may turn to the sea today is because their interests are clearly maritime today. The whole economic development of China in the last 40 years has come from the free market economy that is basically maritime. It was the opening of the maritime ports of China that enabled China to develop the way it has done the last 40 years. They are now dependent on the sea in a way they had never been dependent before. That is a big difference to Chinese history. And therefore, their challenge to everybody else is that nobody had the experience of China being interested in the sea. The, people, the, sea, the, the, the maritime countries that the border on the South China Sea have never seen a China that was that interested in the sea before. So I think they do not know how to deal with it. The Chinese themselves are not sure how to deal with it because they are new to it. They have never shown any interest in that, in that area for at least the last thousand years. So to, to do it now and to do it rather rapidly as they become rich and powerful, much more quickly than anybody expected, I think creates tremendous tensions around, all around. Well, the conclusion that I think Peter Bosch was working towards yesterday was that uh, the last two centuries, the seas, South China Sea, Indian Ocean, the stability, promoting our trade, has been because of Royal Navy, mastery, dominance of the sea, and in the second half of the 20th century, the U.S. 7th Fleet. So, in the light of what Prof. Wang has been today, are we back to the future of the 17th century? The sea is contested space between rival navies. In this case today, in the case of the 17th century, it was the Dutch and the Portuguese and the British later. Today, are we seeing a revival of that in the Chinese uh, revival of the PLA Navy, the U.S. Seventh Fleet, uh, Indian turn to the East, India is the only other country that the Asian power that effectively operates aircraft carriers. So, in that long sea of history, how do we read this turn to the sea? Are we back to that 17th century? And if so, what do we in ASEAN, especially Singapore, navigate this contested space now. Let me turn to Mr. Yatiman Yusuf, whether he wants to say anything. Very good morning to all of you. <clears throat> good morning, everyone. I'm not supposed to be one of those uh, giving response to the ideas and the uh, <clears throat> positions taken by the presenters. But uh, talking about the Orang Laut, the Orang Laut or the Sea Bajaus exists very prominently in areas where there are river estuaries. You go to Sabah, the Bajaus, the Sarawak, the Dayak Laut, known also as the Dayak Bajaus. In Singapore itself, the Sleta people are Orang Laut living very near to the estuary of Johor River, one of the major rivers in, in this part of the world. Then the second one comes from Kalang River. They call it Orang Kalang. These are the Orang Laut in Singapore. What were their positions? See, generally in Singapore, there are three categories of people related to the sea. The first one are the Orang Laut who literally lives by the river estuary and the coast on their boats. Second, they are known as the Orang Pulau. 
mostly in the southern part of Singapore. In the old days, we have many pulaus, pulau Sakra, pulau Ola, pulau uh, Terkukur, and so many of them. Many of these people are semi sedentary in the sense that they depend their living on the sea, but they remain on the island. This group of people had been moved to Pasir Panjang, West Coast Road, and Jurong, and now they are happily, I would say, uh, mixed with the rest of Singapore. And as for the Kalang people, they remained quite a long time because there was a location in Lorong Tree near the Kalang River where the Orang Laut congregates in that area and they often go out of Kalang River into the sea and uh, they were there for a long time. The Salita Orang Laut, some of them remained there but many of them had now moved over to Yishun and Hokang. So I think when you ask about whether the Orang Laut are still playing an important role I think in the 14th, 15th, and 16th century, they play an important role because many of the Malays in the inland area, whether in the peninsula of Malaysia, in Aceh, Sia, Indragiri, Aru, and Rokan, they are all dependent upon the sea gypsies, these people who are stronger, who are more uh, resourceful. Some of them name these people as pirates or lanuns. But they are the strong group of Malays in this part of the world. But slowly, as the Western power moved in, especially the British, their role are being slowly uh, reduced. So I think now we still have the descendants of Orang Laut in Singapore. They have formed part of our integral society. And uh, in the last talk that you all had, I mentioned that uh, one of the Mr. Lee Kuan Yew's first cabinet minister, Mr. Osman Wo, was known as a Kalang man, Orang Kalang. So I think they have been slowly uh, immersed into the Singapore society. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yakman, for that deep insight into the very local history of the Orang Lao and where they are still in Malay community identities today. For those of you who will be interested, there is a wonderful novel by our award-winning, cultural Madden award-winning uh, Malay author, Isa Kamari, Rawa, which goes into vivid detail about the relations between the Orang Lao and the Malays in the 1950s in Singapore here. But we have 10 minutes left. Are there any issues, questions from the floor? I've been instructed by our conference organizers that you are not going to see the audience from here. Please ask them to line up at the uh, mic. And I see one over there. Thank you, Professor and Diane, Professor Wang. Um, I'm Francis Nian from JTC. Um, if I may paraphrase your comments this morning at the price of being somewhat controversial, you seem to be saying that if Singapore is to amount to any more than a peripheral outpost, Singapore would need to disconnect from the Malay world surrounding the, the geography of Singapore and connect to a wider world beyond. What does this mean for the various attempts that Singapore has initiated or been involved in since independence to try to reconnect with the immediate Southeast Asian vicinity, um, ASEAN as a political grouping, but also various government level attempts, for example, the Singapore Johor Rial initiative um, in the 1990s, and more recently, I mean, attempts to be involved in the Skanda region in Johor. These all seem to me to be attempts to reconnect. Are they doomed to failure? Before I turn over to Prof Wang and Prof Antaya to answer these specific questions here, I think we should take a few more and we can answer as a group here. So I see a gentleman there. I'm sorry I can't recognize you. The lights are shining in my eyes here. <laughs> 
Uh, my name is Tan Keng Soon. I'm from Tan Keng Foundation. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, Professor Wang for teaching us something new. I didn't know before that there was uh, another separation. Uh, that one uh, happened in 1819. But may I suggest that, uh, maybe I'm just being nitpicking, but may I suggest that actually it happened in 1824 because Raffles only established a trading post. It was in 1824 where Crawford uh, signed a treaty of friendship with uh, Tunku Hussein or, or the Sultan of Singapore at that time. And, th and that was when it was really officially and wholly British, you see. Because I believe the Sultan was uh, trying to establish a Kajaran, or I'm not sure whether I pronounce it correctly, trying to establish a trading port based along Kalang River whereas the British took uh, Singapore River. Yeah, thank you. That one there, maybe Prof. Andai, you also want to jump in, but I see uh, another person standing there. Uh, hello, uh, professors. Thank you for your presentations. Uh, my name is Pranav Harish, and I'm from the United World College here in Tampanese. I'm a student there. And my question was for Prof. Wang. And my question was that, uh, sort of pertaining to the current issues happening in Hong Kong right now. And it was, I was just curious as to how has Hong Kong developed such a, its own sense of national identity and is so sort of against the Chinese system of Chinese judiciary system, even though it was so overwhelmingly connected with China, as you said, after the British sort of separated its connections with Hong Kong and Hong Kong was sort of much more reliant on the Chinese trade. We have, that's it. We have three questions, and one is about the new connections we are making Singapore thing today to the region, ASEAN, and I would add here that Singapore Johor, Real Growth Triangle. Maybe Prof Wang, you want to look at that, and then uh, Prof Leonard, maybe you want to look at the issue of the Kerajaan and whether it was 1819 or 1824 and what was the role of the Malay sultans. And the third question, I think, was clearly for Prof Wang. And you have got five minutes and 51 seconds before the fire alarm goes off. <laughs> Prof Wang. Well, let, let me say that I, I, I didn't intend to suggest that Singapore cannot reconnect. It is going to be difficult because I think the long centuries of uh, the two centuries of uh, separation has developed a habit of mind which makes it much easier for Singapore to connect with distant places far away. The further away, the better. Whereas uh, connecting nearby is somewhat less comfortable. This is the impression I have anyway. And I think that is the uh, underlying factor of 200 years of uh, a particular experience. I don't think the reconnection is impossible. It is just that it is a challenge. This is what I meant by the challenge of being part of Southeast Asia, a new nation in the middle of altogether 10 nations, in, and in, right in the middle of something even much more complicated as, is the, as the world it shrinks and the superpowers of the world uh, focus on this part of the world, it becomes even more challenging. But the fact is that this challenge requires Singapore to do both. It still has to connect with the pe places far away in order to survive economically. And politically too, as a security-wise as well. But at the same time, unless it reconnects with the neighborhood, with the nearby states, it will find it extremely difficult to face the next few decades, as it were. On the second question of separation, actually, I totally agree. I didn't mean to say it has to be 1819. That is the period. That decade, 1819 and 1924, sealed it. But it was 1819 that made 1940. Uh, made 1824 inevitable, so to speak. The, the two are connected. As for Hong Kong, let me say that uh, it's a misunderstanding to say that Hong Kong was not con Hong Kong was so connected, it was never separated from China. Even though it was administered by the British as a colony, all the people in China were actively involved in Chinese affairs, and China was actively involved in Hong Kong affairs from 1840 right down to the present. They never really stopped. And what I wanted to emphasize was that connection was so close that it's so difficult for the Hong Kongers today to try and seek to find their own identity. 
the fact that they could not be a nation that Singapore could, many Hong Kongers told me before that they would love to have been, had a chance to be independent like Singapore, but there was no question of it. Right from the beginning, there was no question of it. And in, in 1949, you can say the PLA could have marched into Hong Kong, but the British would not have fought to keep Hong Kong. They did not because it was in China's interest to keep it this way. The two, two systems is primarily in China's interest, not in Hong Kong's interest. And the Hong Kong people, of course, would like to preserve it, but China keeps the two systems for its own interest, and we will keep it that way as long as it serves China's interest very well. And that is because the connection was so close. There's never any question of Hong Kong being separate in any way. Whereas Singapore, as I suggest, was separate most of the time, and its efforts to reconnect have been much more difficult because that separation experience is much deeper, much more deep, much deeper than the, any attempts to reconnect. The reconnecting efforts have been made, but they have not been successful. And whether the next generation of Singaporeans can do that successfully is really up to them. But the pressures to do so, the challenge to do so, is very great. And I'm convinced that the Singapore government is aware of it and has been trying very hard to try and reconnect at different levels, but reconnect without losing the global connections, the, the connections, for, uh, the distant connections must also remain for Singapore to, to thrive. Leonard, you, uh, I think you can ignore the fire alarm that will go off in one minute and 46 seconds from now. Okay, so uh, let, let me just comment on the connectivity as well with yes. Singapore. Um, I still remember um, Ambassador um, Chan Heng Chi, uh, we were students together at Cornell. One of the things she was saying is that what is interesting is that you can go to an international meeting and the Southeast Asians tend to get together. They feel kind of a bond. And I think this is one of the things that has developed uh, a sense that Singapore really belongs to the region. And if you look, um, I, I was for a time at ISIS Yusuf Ishak Institute. And one of the things that's very striking there is that you get a lot of these uh, scholars who come from the different ASEAN region um, to spend some time in Singapore. And one of the things we can't escape is the region really looks to Singapore because of the wealth and the knowledge, uh, the facilities that you have here. So Singapore can play a very important, histor a, a, an important uh, leadership role in the region. And I think they are doing that now. So I think that the connections are already started, it is still very strong. Of course, you still have envy um, on the other side, right? And the thing, this is such a fantastically wealthy place, why is it so? So you, you tend to uh, look down upon Singapore or try to find fault with Singapore, but you have to rise above this, and I think it's very important that you retain that leadership role and continue these connections. And the world connections are out there, it's, it's been very successful. I don't think there are any problems there. The, the, the thing about 1819 and 1824 is the fact that the Europeans were the ones who made all of these decisions without referring whatsoever to the local rulers. And so one of the things that happened after the British and the Dutch divided the, the, the area into a British and Dutch uh, sphere of influence is that the local uh, kingdoms and rulers had no idea what was going on, and they continued to operate as if there were no real barriers. So, so the Malay rulers and family moved backward and forward across the Malay Peninsula, Sumatra, into the Riau areas, and so forth. And it was the Europeans who tried to say, you can't do that anymore. And they said, why not? This is our, our, our land, our people are over there. And so there is a sense that that into, into 1824 agreement was really a European agreement, but that was not something that the, the Malay Kingdom signed onto. And unfortunately, they were powerless to do very much, and so what you find here is a division of the Malay world between Sumatra and the Malay Peninsula, or, and the, say, the areas of Southwest Borneo. And again, this is just obviously what happens in colonial regimes. You look at um, creation of Indonesia or creation of Nigeria, these are put together by the colonial regimes. And eventually, you have some successes and failures. Um, and I think uh, this is a result of colonialism, which we must uh, continue to think about. Thank you. Well, thank you. We'll 
Prof Wang and uh, Prof Andaya. Uh, I see we are, the little screen there says time extended, but I don't think we should stand between you and tea break, and certainly I don't want uh, Dr. Jilin Ko and Mr. Janadas to mark me down as a poor, incompetent moderator who can't keep time. So on that note, I'll invite you to join me to thank Prof Wang and Prof Leonard.